Let me talk to you uh, about uh, our, our series today, On Purpose, and you see the title there, Let's Pray On Purpose. I think you'll understand here in just a bit what I mean when I say that and when we read our text in just a bit from Acts chapter 4. We're talking about how to live on purpose, and I believe that an essential element of that is prayer. And now, all of these really that we're going to be talking about in this series are essential elements, but I believe this is a very important, significant, powerful element among all the elements that help us live our lives on purpose. And by praying, specific praying on purpose, not just broad, generalized, unspecific prayer, but focused prayer, uh, prayers of intention, prayers that are offered specifically toward uh, particular kinds of things. A friend of this church, Robert Morgan, who has spoken here on several occasions, has a wonderful book called Worry Less and Live More, and I recommend that book to you. He tells in that book a story about President William McKinley praying as he lay dying from an assassin's bullet in Buffalo, New York in 1901. Prayer had been a lifelong practice that guided McKinley uh, through his political career and into his presidency. In fact, McKinley uh, had been born to a devout Christian home 58 years before, and at the age of 14, he trusted Christ as his Savior. And McKinley learned to pray from his mother. His mother was a wonderful prayer example and encourager to him. But his greatest lessons in prayer uh, came under the pressures of serving as uh, president of the United States. One of the heaviest decisions that he ever faced was in 1898 regarding the status of the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. What to do with the Philippines? And uh, around that time, or shortly thereafter, really, uh, there was a delegation of church, church leaders that came to see McKinley, and they were in casual conversation about decision-making and important decisions, and McKinley began to relate to them uh, how he resolved the crisis in the Philippines. And he told them, he said, the truth is, I didn't want the Philippines. I didn't know what to do. He said, I sought counsel on all sides, both Democrat and Republicans, but they were of no help. Amazing how things haven't changed. (laughs) He said, I walked the floor of the White House night after night until midnight. And he said, I'm not ashamed to tell you, gentlemen, that I went down on my knees and prayed to the Almighty God for light and guidance more than one night. And then one night late, as I paced and was praying, I came, it came to me this way. And McKinley related the strategy that developed in his mind as he prayed and asked God for wisdom. And this is what it was, he said, that the Philippines should be taken seriously and helped, that the United States should, quote, by by God's grace do the very best we could by them, that is the Philippines, as our fellow men for whom Christ has died. And then McKinley added to these leaders and he said, and then I went to bed, I went to sleep, and I slept soundly. I believe it is accurate to say that much of our prayer is so unfocused that when God answers it, we don't even recognize it. That's why praying on purpose is important. And we'll see that, I believe, in the passage that I want us to look at this morning. How to pray focused, intentional prayers and expecting to see God's answer. Would you stand with me this morning if you're physically able to do so as we read our scripture? Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23, says, When they were released, that's Peter and John, they had been held captive, they had been in prison. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. The chief priests and elders had told them to stop speaking about Jesus. And when they uh, heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, that's prayer. They lifted their voices together to to, uh, to God. They said this, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, 
to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Father, may that be true of us. May this place be a house shaken by prayer as we seek you and we desire to walk in your ways and align our lives with your will. Would you teach us a bit more about praying and about seeking you this morning? Would you take your word and use your Holy Spirit to minister it to our hearts, to change our lives, to convict us, and Father, cause our minds to be renewed by its truth. Father, would you take my words, would you take my thoughts, all of my study now, Father, and would you use it, Father, for your glory and yours alone, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, the church was young. The book of Acts is the birth of the church. The church was young, and it was growing dramatically. There were 3,000 added on one occasion. There were 5,000 added on another occasion. It was growing dramatically. There were many miracles taking place, and the the believers (coughs) were gathering daily, it says. They were gathering daily for the teaching of the apostles, for the fellowship of being with one another, as well as, it said, breaking bread together. But it was also a time of great persecution and suffering. Ironically, it was the religious leaders that were behind the persecution, the Sanhedrin. They were the ones who had essentially orchestrated the plot to have Jesus crucified. And now they were trying to shut down this this emerging uh, uh, church, what was happening there. They wanted to, to shut it down. They were trying to silence the church and silence believers and to intimidate them and to shut them up. And so the young church did what they should have done and what God's people should do. They gathered together, and they got on their knees, and they prayed. Now, when you study the early church, one of the practices that most characterizes these believers was their purposeful prayer gatherings, their devotion to seek God. Either something came up, they prayed. Something was going on, they prayed. Whatever it was, they got together. They gathered together and prayed. We'll do that this Tuesday night, by the way, from 6 to 7. I'm asking you to be here We're going to be praying specifically about the matters related to our public libraries. I want you here. Would you be here? Six o'clock, one hour. Could you, can you come and watch and pray for an hour with us about these matters? And and so six o'clock, we're going to practice focused prayer, just like the early church did. But they were characterized by this. For example, Acts 1.14 says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Acts 3.1 says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Acts 12.5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made uh, for him was made to God by the church. This was characteristic of the church. They prayed. They prayed. That's why Jesus said, let my house be a house of prayer. And then, of course, the passage we just read, which is, I believe, one of the most dramatic prayers in the New Testament because it reflects the way that the early Christian church prayed. And and note in their prayer they did something. If, If you paid attention when we were reading the text, you notice they addressed the sovereign creation of God. Then they address the sovereign revelation of God that he'd spoken through his servant David. And then they, they address the sovereign incarnation of God, which was Jesus, uh, who was the epitome of the revelation of God. They brought all of these into their prayer. Their point in addressing these things in prayer was to exalt God, to honor God, to point out who God is, but is also so that they can recognize and remind themselves that because he is the God of creation, he is the God of revelation, he is the God of the incarnation, that there's nothing, nothing that is too insignificant to bring to him in prayer. 
And that being true, then their prayer becomes very practical. And it's characterized by two, what I've called prayer procedures that we see right here. The first is this, in verse 29, they say, grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. They prayed precisely. Their prayer was not a broad kind of vanilla prayer. They they didn't pray something like, Lord, help everyone to talk more about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad prayer, but they got, they went very, they said, Lord, would you help us to speak the word with boldness? Not, Lord, just, let's get everybody. Can everybody just talk more about Jesus? Our grandson, both of our grandsons and our daughter were in town this past week, and and I got to thinking, and so I was working on the message this week about a little incident, a prayer incident that happened with our older grandson. He's five. And just a few weeks ago, um, he came down with the flu. And, um, and so we called and checked in. We FaceTimed. Alice and I did just to check on him. And we'd prayed, of course, uh, for him. Alice and I had prayed together, and we'd prayed for him. And the Lord would bring him through the flu and everything. And so, But we're FaceTiming. The poor little guy's in bed. He's just not feeling. You know how it feels with the flu. And so we FaceTime in there just to talk with him, and, and so we're talking to him. And toward the end of our conversation, he, he said, Pops, I don't feel good. I said, I know, buddy. And I said, uh, Yaya and Pops, we're going to keep praying for you. And we're about to end the conversation when he suddenly said back, he said, you know, Pops, you could pray for me right now. <laughs> and I said, you know what, I sure could. And I sure did. And I want to tell you something. When I prayed for Bodie, it wasn't, it wasn't broad. It was very specific. My grandson didn't feel good. My grandson had the flu. I didn't say, Lord, a lot of people have the flu. Heal all the flu. Take the flu away. I said, Lord, my grandson's got the flu. He needs you to touch his little body. And protect him and take away the flu from him. Specific. Now, I'm not against God taking the flu away, period. Amen? But in that moment, I'm praying specifically for my grandson. If you had the flu, I didn't pray for you. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Unless I knew you had the flu and you had asked me to pray for you, okay? But you understand in that moment, I'm praying for him. I'm praying specifically. And just like that, their prayer was very precise. Lord, help us, bless us, favor us, cause us to continue to speak your word with boldness. I don't know if you know the name of John Knox in church history. He was the founder of the Presbyterian Church, and uh, John Knox was known for his specific and powerful praying. And of John Knox, Mary, the Queen of Scotland, said this. She said, I fear John Knox's prayers more than an army of 10,000 men. If you want to see the power of God through prayer, start praying precisely. And then you'll see precise answers. I think God answers a lot of our prayers that are kind of broad, but we just don't recognize it because they're so broad. We don't. You know what's fun? When you pray precise. And then you go, wow, God did exactly that. Our staff, we were talking about it. I had a couple of stories back uh, from my first pastorate about how our economy wasn't keeping up with the growth. We just exploded in growth, but we didn't explode in giving. And there were things that we needed to do and wanted to do. And so we would just come together and pray. Our staff would pray specifically for a matter. And I can tell you, look, look, it's just amazing. And then within uh, a day or a week, that prayer would get, I don't just mean kind of answered, I mean got specifically answered. And it was faith building for us, and it was faith building for our prayer life, and it was faith building for our church. You want to see God move specifically, pray specifically. Do you get that? The second procedure I want you to note here is that they prayed publicly. Verse 31, well really this is reflected in so many different places, but verse 31, and when they Uh, had prayed the place where they were gathered together. When I say public praying, by that I mean pray in a gathering with the people of God to seek God. You see this word gather frequently in the book of Acts. I mean, it's frequently mentioned. 
That's because these believers craved the fellowship of one another, and they wanted to pray with each other for one another and for specific things that God was doing. Now, I'm not suggesting that gathered praying is a replacement for personal and private praying. Praying. You understand that? That's not a, it's not a, 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 say, well, I prayed publicly, so I don't have, no, no, it's all of the above, class. Personal, private prayer, and also corporate gathered prayer. We need all of these, and these are important to us. But if you take the scripture seriously, you can't help but acknowledge how very important it is for the people of God to come together for corporate prayer. The corporate prayer of God's people is the means to move the hand of God. The scripture is very clear about this. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And Acts 12, 12 says when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and praying. There's a great need today for precise public praying by God's people. And I'm afraid sometimes that the church has forgotten the importance of getting together. You can, get together, you can get people together for a lot of different church events, but prayer seems to suffer more than any of them. And so they prayed publicly. They prayed precisely. And the result of that were what I'm calling some prayer products. What happened as a result of that? And I want to give you three of those this morning for the rest of the message. Here they are, three prayer products that were the result of praying precisely and praying together publicly. The place where they gathered, it says, together was shaken. The place was shaken. That's the first product. The place was shaken. It wasn't an earthquake that rocked the place. It was shaken by the Spirit of God. I heard one pastor talking about it. He said they were having a worship experience in his church. And he's up in Tennessee, and he said, we're having a worship experience in our church. And the choir and orchestra were leading in this powerful anthem, and it was just so worshipful, and all of a sudden, the building began to shake. He said, the building literally began to shake. And he, he said, my first inclination was, is this Acts chapter 4? And he said, but I decided instead to try to help everybody get out of the building because the chandelier above was shaking, and uh, he said, I went and stood next to a wall and we later found out it was just a big earthquake in the area. <laughs> this wasn't an earthquake. This was the Spirit of God that shook the place, that rocked the place. Their prayer was so powerful, it caused the building to radiate. And the shake was a sign to them that God had shown up. And the fact is, when God shows up, things get shaken up. God was manifesting himself. He was manifesting his presence. He was affirming their prayer. God was affirming their prayer in that moment. I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time you've been shaken by the presence of God? When was the last time that you allowed the presence of God to rock your life and change you? Things happen when we seek God. God shows up. When we pray, by the way, God may shake up your thinking. That is, he may change your worldview. Our world needs a shaking. I pray for a shaking that will come, but you and I need a shaking too. We need our thinking shook up sometimes. If we're not careful, our thinking will become not a whole, it'll just become a sanctified version of how the world thinks. We'll just throw a verse on top of ours, but we'll give ourselves the uh, the, the, a pass on is am I thinking the way God wants me to think when God shows up he's changed the way you think I remember COVID I told you this I remember during COVID I remember we shut down for about six weeks wasn't it Chuck wasn't it about six weeks I remember coming this building it was empty and it wasn't because of rain it was empty 
It's because we shut down. We said, we, uh, we, you know, we don't want people getting sick and all of those kinds of things. And we were listening to what the world was telling us. Now, we were doing it with good intentions, and we we're trying to do it in accord with Romans chapter 13. And this isn't a message about that, so I won't go there. But I can remember walking in this room like this, except nobody here. And just our television cameras were on. And we were streaming and recording it for television. And I remember the first day I came in here, that first Sunday, I came in here. And I wondered this. I wonder, will I ever see people in here again? You remember, people were terrified. And I wonder, will I ever see people in here again? Will this place ever be full again? Will it ever have what we've had uh, before? And I, I wondered, and I, I preached. And I want to tell you something. It's hard to preach without people. I knew there were people, there were, there were literally, we, we learned, there were thousands of people watching us. And I knew I was preaching, and I tried to keep my mind on that. I'm preaching, there are people watching that are taking this in, and it's valuable. And we heard from them, and people got saved, and people were joining. But I want to tell you something, it wasn't the same without you sitting there. Or at least in my mind. And I remember for doing that for a couple of weeks, and and, and I have to tell you, I got depressed. It was spiritual depression. I knew what it was. I've been there. I knew what to do about it, but I got depressed. And I'm praying. I'm, I'm down uh, in my little prayer closet, and, and I'm praying, and I'm talking to the Lord. And I'm whining. I'm whining, and I'm weeping. Jesus, I just did Jesus. Will they ever be back? I wasn't fussing at the people. I was just saying, God, I just, Lord, are they gone forever? Will they ever be back? Lord, it's so empty. That's what I was telling him. It's so empty. And this is how I'm going. Do y'all ever, have y'all ever whined? Y'all are looking so spiritual right now, like you've never done that. (laughs) And I am, I am just, I'm having a spiritual pity party with God. And I remember one morning, as I'm repeating my pity to God, he whispered to my heart. I mean, I whispered probably isn't the right term because it was so powerful. It was almost like he said, okay, are you done? You finished? And this is what he spoke to my heart. Quit telling me the house is empty. He said, if I fill the house, the house is full. And he said, this is my house. It's not your house. So when you go in there to preach, you remember I'm in the house. And when I'm in the house, the house is full. And he told me, he took me back to Scripture. He does this so often uh, when I seek him. He'll take me to a passage to affirm He'll affirm what he's told me. He took me to Isaiah. And where Isaiah said, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. I said, Lord, that's good. I got it. I said, I get that. No more whining. And I came in, and it really did change. Now, I made some staff members come and sit in here on purpose. But here's why I tell you that. When you pray specifically, even if you whine specifically to God, then God can answer specifically. Hello? And he may deal with the way you're thinking. He changed the way I was thinking. When we pray, God not only changes or shakes up the way we think, he may shake up our physical world too. He, he, may, he may say there are things physically in your life we're going to make adjustments in. We're going to make changes. When we pray, God may shake our plans up. He may change the path that you were walking on. You're going this way, and God says, no, no, you've been seeking me for direction, so I'm going to give it to you. You've been asking for it. That was William McKinley. God, what do I do about the Philippines? God, tell me what to do, and God did. He may change your plans. Listen, God may not always shake the foundations of a building to affirm his presence when we pray, but that's okay 
Because Jesus has given us a promise that confirms his presence when we pray, and that's enough. Jesus said this, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So here's the bottom line. Because they were prayed up, God showed up, and when God showed up, the place was shaken up. Now, I'm not trying to create a formula. I'm not trying to create a formula, but what I do know is that when God's people gather to pray, God has promised to show up and to hear them and to respond. That's why we're going to get together on Tuesday evening. God put that on my heart. Did I tell you about that? I told you. Did I tell you about that? I'm driving, I'm praying, I'm talking about stuff we've been dealing with and talking about, and the Lord says, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. You've done everything but call the people together to pray. I said, I'll do that too. We're going to do that Tuesday. Because when God's people gather and seek God, God hears and shows up. The second thing, the second product that I want you to see is not just was the place uh, shaken, but second, the people were filled. Verse 31 is an incredible verse. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. The place was shaken, but the people were filled. Being filled with the Spirit was a result of their prayer. The the Spirit fell on every one of them. Now, this wasn't a second Pentecost that we see earlier in the book. It was a refreshing of the power of God on their lives. And wouldn't you agree, from time to time, we all need this renewal We all need this refreshment if we're going to continue to thrive spiritually and continue to withstand the pressures and the opposition and the attacks of the enemy. Would you agree that we all need that refreshment from time to time? That's what this was. Fresh fillings, listen, fresh fillings of the Holy Spirit are one of the wonderful provisions that God has made for us. It's one of the wonderful gifts that come to us as a result of our relationship with God. And we need it. We need it to do the work of God. We can't do it without the work of God. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, he pastored for many years, and he said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. He said, on the other hand, if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would have stopped and everybody would have known the difference. You see, you can't sustain spiritual work without spiritual power. And this is one of the things that comes when we seek God. If you do not have spiritual power, there really are only two possible reasons. One is you're not saved because this comes with the relationship. The other reason, if you don't have that power, it is that you haven't surrendered. You may be saved, but you're not surrendered to him. You're still living out of your own power and your own strength. And you need strength that comes from the source of the Spirit of God residing in you. I read about an 82-year-old woman named Willie Murphy. She heard the sound of an intruder breaking into her home. She's 82. Y'all got that? And she, she, she felt bad. She felt bad for the intruder. <laughs> Murphy said to the reporters after the incident that she said, and I quote, he picked the wrong house to break into. <laughs> That's because Willie Murphy was already a critically acclaimed bodybuilder At 82, having won the World Natural Power Lifting Upstate New York Championship in 2018. (laughs) After calling the police, she used the darkness to lie in wait for the assailant. And then when the moment was right, she struck this uh, intruder with all of her strength and agility. Then she picked up a table, and broke it over him. (laughs) And then she said, I went to work on him. (laughs) After breaking the table, Murphy briefly poured a whole bottle of shampoo on his face and then continued to wail away on him with a broom handle. (laughs) 
That's one bad mama right there. <laughs> the police who responded were so impressed, she said, that they, quote, wanted to go on my front porch and take selfies with me. <laughs> I really did a number on that man. I want to tell you something. There's an intruder that wants to break into your life. And he will, unless you've got the power to fight him off. And you don't, but the Spirit of God in you does. Let the Spirit wail away at the intruder. The Spirit of God enabled these believers to have the power they needed to face the adversity and the intimidation of their enemies. And we have access, listen, 2,000 years later, we're the church. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, all of us, we have access to the very same power. They were all, not some, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It happened, look, look, look at verse 31, I want you to see the first phrase. And when they had prayed, it didn't happen before, it happened after they prayed. They prayed, and then these products occurred. But there's one last thing, and I'll show you. One last product, and that is, not only were the people filled, but look at this, the prayer was answered. Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and here it is, here's the answer, and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. You remember we talked about praying precisely? You remember that? We started the message with that. Uh, look, at, look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. You know what that was? You know what that was? That was their request. That was the specific prayer that they offered. Do you see it? Their specific prayer, their spe precise prayer request was that they would be given continued boldness to speak the Word of God. And God answered their prayer. We know because it says, and they continued to speak the Word with boldness. They were filled with the Spirit who then gave them the boldness to continue in the face of opposition, difficulty, and persecution. Specific praying Bring specific answers. That's what praying on purpose is. I'm going to ask you, have you stopped praying specifically? Have you stopped? You know, I think sometimes we, we don't pray specifically because we don't want to put God in a bind. Or really, we don't want to say, well, I prayed specifically and God didn't answer my prayer and I don't know how to defend God. Quit worrying about defending God. If he wants to answer it, he'll answer it. You don't worry about that. Well, I pray, I don't know how to pray specifically in front of other people because if God doesn't come through, what will other people think about God? I'm just protecting God's reputation. Quit defending God's reputation. He doesn't need that. And if he doesn't answer the way you think he should answer, maybe you didn't ask the right prayer. And secondly, if he doesn't answer the way you've requested, it's just possible that that is the answer. I'm not, an uh, no. You wanted an answer, here's the answer, no. God has given me that answer before on some specific things. Don't be afraid to pray specifically. Now, be careful. James, you remember we just went through the book of James. Y'all remember all of those sermons I preached, don't you? You remember that one, James says that you have not because you ask not. And he says, and you ask and you don't receive because you ask with what? With self, selfish motive. Now, <clears throat> there are two pieces of that equation. Number one is you have not because you ask not. First, you've got to start with asking. Then, number two, you've got to ask the right stuff. You say, well, I, don't, I sometimes don't know how to pray. Has somebody ever told you pray for me and you thought, I don't know how to pray for them? Or has God ever put somebody on your heart to pray for? And you thought, but what I pray, what I pray, how, how do, here's what I learned to do a long time ago. I say, God, what do you want me to pray for them? What do you want me to pray for them? 
I was talking with Steve Gaines. By the way, he's doing fantastic. And uh, I was talking to him a, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, I just called to tell you that here's a verse God put on my heart to pray for you. Ironically, he said, well, the rest of that passage God had put on my heart. What a coincidence. No coincidence with God. God, what do you want me to pray? How do I pray for, for him? How do I pray for them? You want to know? Ask God. Ask God. William McKinley, did y'all get the, that, that story? William McKinley, he's pacing at night. God, what do I do? God, what do I do with the, uh, uh, that place? The Philippines. I started to say the Philistines. <laughs> we, which is good prayer too. God, what do you want me to do with the Philistines? I think they're still out there, by the way. What do you want me to do about the Philippines? He asked, he asked, he asked, and then by the way, it may not, you may not get a specific answer immediately. It may take time. God, help me know what to, and let me tell you something. You say, well, I'm afraid I'll get selfish in my prayers. Let me tell you how to avoid that. Be full of the Holy Spirit. I think that's why the Holy Spirit is so important in specific praying, because if you're filled with, a, did you notice what they asked for? Oh, God, listen, it was tough. Did you know it was financially tough on them in that time? They were having to sell all that they had and give it to each other just to keep each other, you know, just so they could, they could live. Because some of them most likely lost their jobs because of their faith. And they were selling what they had, and they were taking one, and they were doing it with joy too, by the way. And time, so times were tough for them. And, and yet, what, what they did is they said, hey, we're going to take care of each other. And the Holy Spirit filled them and enabled them to do the work of God. And they didn't say, God, times are tough, so would you beef my bank account up? Now, God can do it if he wants to, and that's okay. But that's not what they prayed. Did you see what they prayed for? They prayed for something that is undeniably the will of God. Lord, let us speak boldly for you in a very intimidating culture. Man, that's a prayer we need today, isn't it? Lord, let me speak boldly for you. It's pretty intimidating out there. They prayed specifically. They prayed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, praying specifically doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes it's very simple. Theologian Francis Schaeffer, <clears throat> whom... I admired for so many years, has gone to be with the Lord back a number of years ago, but he tells a story back when he was flying from Europe back to America, Minneapolis, Minnesota. His family was there, and he was on a, a prop plane flying over the ocean, over the Atlantic Ocean, trying to get back to Minneapolis. And uh, while he's flying, uh, one of the engines, you're over the Atlantic Ocean, one of the engines shuts down. And... Um, People in aviation will tell you that that's not good, but you can fly on. You've got, enough, you got a, enough firepower to keep going. You hit three other engines, and so we, they could do it. And uh, uh, he calls the um, steward's wife and says, Ma'am, he said, <laughs> that engine's not working. And he said, she was a little gruff and said, Oh, you people think you know everything. You know, she was probably a little stressed when you say because shortly thereafter, a, a second engine went out. And now, you can make it if one goes out, but you can't make it if two go out. And the plane began to lose altitude. And um, they radioed back into the coast, the North American coast. Somehow, this was picked up on radio that there was a problem with the plane over the Atlantic. It just so happened that Schaefer's family happened to be listening and heard the bulletin on the radio. We interrupt this program and blah, blah, blah. And, to, uh, uh, and they began to pray, God, God, would you start the engines? Francis Schaefer, in his book, tells about his own prayer. After two went out, the pilot began to give instructions. We're trying to get the engine, but we can't promise and whatever else they were saying. And, and we need to prepare that we're going to probably ditch into the ocean and this sort of stuff. And Francis Schaeffer, I was waiting, this great theologian, what would he pray? What would he pray? And he said, and so I bowed my head, and this is what I prayed. Lord, start the engines. 
It wasn't, it wasn't big theology, was it? Lord, start the engines. People were praying in Minneapolis, that same prayer, Lord, start the engines. Lord, start the engines. The engine started. He made it, obviously. He was able to write about it, tell about it. The engine started uh, as, as he was getting off the plane. The pilot was standing there, and Schaefer said to the pilot, What happened? And the pilot says, I have no explanation. He said, if one engine dies, you can sometimes restart a single engine. I guess that's like, you know, letting the car go down a hill and popping the clutch. Some of y'all remember doing that. But if two go out, he said, in avionics, it's just really there's no hope. So he said, I have no explanation. They just started up. Schaefer said, I can tell you what happened. God started the engine. Specific praying doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be a theologian. In fact, maybe some theologians need to learn that specific praying is pretty simple. It's one of the reasons that Jesus loves children. So I'm building Legos with my grandson this week. He loves, he's into Legos. And he's good at them. He's better than I can't build it. He can do it. I have to pay such attention to the instructions, but he can just kind of it's so fascinating. And we're building Legos. And so I'm watching him really build the Legos. And I said to him, I said, Bodie, I said, you love Legos, don't you? And he said, yeah, Pops, I love Legos. But I don't love them more than God. He said, I love God more than anything. Well, you know what Alice and I have been praying specifically? That he would love God. Put in his heart a passion for God. He lo I love Legos, but I don't love them more than God. Let me ask you something. Have you got any Legos in your life that have replaced God? You know why Jesus loved the children? It's because they got it. They, they got the simplicity of it all. Specific Praying is not about presenting God with your punch list of wants and wishes, but it is instead specifically praying in line with his purposes along with his people. And I believe it's one of the reasons. Did you notice it said, and, and God, will, will, you'll continue to use your hand to bring healing and do miracles and wonders. Did you notice that? They prayed. They prayed in line with God's plans and purposes. They prayed on purpose for God's will to be accomplished. They prayed specifically. Nothing has changed since they prayed and where we are today. Sometimes our prayers just need to be, God, start the engine. Let's pray. Father, we do. We Lord, we desire to see your hand move. You did miracles then. We know you still do miracles today, wonders, signs. I think we've lost the expectation that you would do it for us. Lord, help us to not be afraid to ask specifically those things which were in line and are in line with your word and your will. Lord, maybe there's some in here today or some watching by live stream or television, some listening on radio, and they don't even know you. But right now, your spirit is tugging at their hearts. Would you cause them to say yes to that pull, to put their trust, to call out to you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right now, for those, I pray that they will call on you to be their Savior. For others, Lord, who have forgotten to seek you personally, corporately, specifically, God, would you renew and refresh, fall on us fresh with your Holy Spirit and your power. Grant us boldness to live for you and to speak for you. 
In Jesus' name. We ask it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me for our well, invitation? I'm so glad that you have tuned in to the broadcast today. I hope you've been encouraged by God's word. It sure has been a joy to share it with you. And even now, uh, people at Ridgecrest are making decisions for Christ. Perhaps as you've watched this broadcast, you've recognized uh, the need for your own decision for Christ. The prompting of the Spirit has caused you to recognize that uh, you need Christ as your Savior. And the good news is you can receive Him right where you are. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right where you are, you can call on Him. Say something like this from your heart to Him. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know I'm a sinner and I know that you came into this world and died on the cross for my sins. And right now, I invite you to come into my life. Forgive me and be my Savior. I can assure you if you call on Him, based on what God has already told us in the Bible, that He'll hear that prayer and He'll answer that. And He wants to begin this new journey uh, in your life with you, transforming you into His image. We'd love to help you with that decision as well. You'll see a QR code on your screen. And if you would uh, scan that, or you'll see contact information, or if you'll contact us about your decision today, we'd love to help you take next steps. There are no strings attached, no fees involved. We'd just like to help you begin that journey with Christ. You may be watching this broadcast today and say, I need a church family to belong to. I already know Christ as my Savior, and I'd like to be a part of the Ridgecrest family. Also, if you will, scan that QR code. That'll take you to a, a location, and we'll be able to help you make those kinds of decisions like becoming a member here, or if you've never been scripturally baptized, those kinds of things. So contact us through that QR code or through the contact information on the screen. Well, again, it's been a joy to have you with us today, and I hope you've been encouraged by God's Word. Whatever decision we can help you with, by all means, contact us. May the Lord bless you.